all may be seated, it's time for a prayer request. Remember Brother Jim and Sister Sandy. Remember Brother Gary and his health. Remember Sister Rosie and her health. Remember Brother Randy and Sister Bart. Remember Marty and Belle hurt her shoulder. Remember Brother Gene and his health needs. Remember Brother Charlie and his new foot. Remember Sister Ollie and Aunt Dorothy. Remember Sister Nyman Williams. Remember Sister Julie and her health. Remember Dave Swinger and his recovery. Remember Brother Larry and Sister Lee Faust. Remember Brother Chuck's friend Scott Hackenberg's family. He passed away Friday. Brett and Amanda having marriage problems. Remember Jenny Witt recovering from a car accident. Linda Parks, stage four cancer needs prayer. Remember Sister Barb Burr, her surgery had to be canceled, and Sister Barb Burr's son broke his hip. Anybody else have a request? Yeah, keep praying for Julie. She had some tests this week, but we haven't got the results yet. Anybody else? Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for your goodness and how you brought us through another week. And we just praise you for this Resurrection Sunday. We ask your blessings on us. We lift up these on the prayer request. We just ask that your will be done and you'll encourage them and strengthen them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, again, we'd like to say good morning to everybody. We're glad that you came out to be with us this morning. It's a beautiful, sunshiny Sunday. Uh, Resurrection Sunday. Okay, no, I'll be back this up. Resurrection Sunny Sunday morning. There we go. We got it right that time. <laughs> we, uh, a few years back, we started sunrise service. We tried it at 6 o'clock, but the sun didn't come up. And then we tried it at 7 o'clock, and well, sometimes the sun came up, sometimes it didn't. So we moved it up to 8 o'clock. Guess what? We got sunshine today. Praise the Lord. But you know, uh, this is a special day for Christians. For uh, folks who are very much uh, thrilled with being American citizens and so forth, Fourth of July is their great day because they are glad uh, for being United States citizens. And I'm one of them, don't get me wrong. I enjoy the Fourth of July, but I don't enjoy the Fourth of July as much as they do. Others, uh, everything is Christmas. Oh, yes, sir, buddy. We got to get out there on Black Friday and we got to have Christmas and we got to have presents and everybody's got to buy for me and I got to buy for everybody. And I'm, t I'm telling you what, I always kind of like just going to some of the stores about a week before Christmas and watch them drag in and watch them drag out. <laughs> <laughs> Poor folks are so wore out. And, you know, they, they're trying to get the party ready and they're trying to get the party favors and they're trying to get the punch fixed and trying to buy the last few gifts. And there's no wrapping paper over here and there's no toilet paper over there and they're just frustrated and angry and mad and everything. And, it's fun, Bob, just to, just to kind of watch that. Uh, but, you know, we don't have that at Easter. We have a few people who uh, think that the bunny is more important than the lamb, but uh, the money isn't. It's not about Easter eggs. It's not about chocolate bunnies. It's about what happened uh, almost 2,000 years ago. Something that never happened anywhere else uh, to anybody else. Uh, Jesus Christ was crucified, got up out of the grave, and uh, literally walked out. We're going to talk about that a little bit more here this morning. 
But uh, first off, we wanted to ask, is there anybody here wanting to share anything with us that you're part of the service? Uh, you want to brag on the Lord Jesus Christ or just raise your hand and say, I'm glad to be a Christian that you're part of the service? Anybody got a song? Okay, well, we'll just go on in with the message. Last week, we spoke about Palm Sunday, which, of course, uh, every year Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Easter Sunday. It's the Sunday Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Uh, he, he rode in uh, as a king. He rode in as the Messiah, as was prophesied in the Old Testament, uh, several different places. Uh, it was prophesied that he would ride in on a donkey. And if you, you have to read it carefully to see it. But the prophecy was that the mother donkey would also be there. And sure enough, when he sent his disciples to go get the donkey, and if you think you're brave sometime, find someone who has a mule farm or a donkey farm. Tell them that you want to get on a two-year-old mule or a two-year-old donkey that has never been ridden, and you want to just ride it into town with someone leading it. I, by the way, call me when you do that. I want to bring my video camera. We're going to have some fun with that. But of course, he was Jesus Christ. Uh, his father spoke everything into existence, so that donkey was part of his creation, I guess might be a right, right, right way to say it. The donkey recognized him. There was no problem at all. But he did fulfill all of that on that Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon. At that particular point in time, it was the date was the 10th of Nisan. The other thing that happened on the 10th of Nisan was <coughs> all of the Jews went out and selected a male sheep a little lamb that had no imperfections whatsoever. It had to be perfect. It couldn't be blind. It couldn't have a limp ear. It couldn't limp itself. Uh, everything had to be perfect on the outside. Now, you, know, you can't look on the inside. But to look at it, it had to be perfect. They would keep it for the next four days. And on the 14th day of Nisan, they would butcher the little lamb, uh, dress it, roast it over an open fire, and they would have Passover. Uh, Jesus Christ was also selected on the 10th of Nisan, a lamb that had no imperfections whatsoever. Uh, he is the only individual ever to walk the face of this earth who attained adult reality. Now, obviously, you know, we have to back this up just a little bit. There are people who never attain adult reality. They never come to the age of accountability. So, <clears throat> Sister Kay, their sins are never charged to them. They don't know what they're doing. But if anyone comes to the age of accountability, there's never been another person that's lived the life of Jesus Christ and did it without sin. So when he was selected that day as the lamb to be slaughtered, which he was, and then slaughter. And a lot of people don't like to hear me use that word, but that's exactly what happened. They slaughtered Jesus Christ. Uh, the things that he went through to make it possible for us to come to him in prayer and say, thank you, Father, uh, forgive me of my sins. The things that he went through, none of us, thank God, have ever gone through. Very few other people have most people would not have allowed the, you know, their bodies just simply would not have gone through it. He had to. He had to hang on to life so that he could fulfill everything. And uh, that Easter, not Easter, that Easter, that crucifixion Thursday when he was crucified, the one thing that has never, also has never ever happened before at noon that day, it got dark. Pitch black dark. A lot of people have gone around and said, well, you know, there's not really a whole lot of history about Jesus Christ yeah. other than, you know, what, what, the, what, what the Christians said. Well, there is history. There is history, Brother Eugene, of that day that nobody could ever understand what happened at noontime. You know, it's like somebody put the switch and went dark. And the historical accounts of that, Brother Bob, are pitched 
black dark. There was no moon, there was no stars, there was nothing. Pitch black, ugly dark. It was like that for three hours. Finally, the sun, I don't know how else to say it, God turned the sun back on. I don't know how he did it, I'm sure. Uh, there is uh, an explanation, uh, a mechanical or earthly Explanation for what he did. He always does things in a, in a way that you can't explain it other than a miracle. But it was that day. It was a miracle. The sun came out and three hours later, the sun came back. Uh, he had finished his suffering on the cross. Uh, a little bit later, one of the other two people who were crucified with him uh, began to rail on him and say, Hey, if you are the Son of God, why don't you get off that cross and take us with you? The other person that was crucified with him told the first person to shut up that uh, they, as thieves, had earned their crucifixion. They had earned their right to die, if you want to look at it in that direction. They had earned what they were going to get. They were going to die that day. But Jesus hadn't. And the one, to, the one that was on the other cross uh, looked at Jesus and said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And one of the most profound statements you'll ever find in the Bible is just after that. Jesus said today, not tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, 10,000 years from now, today you're going to be with me and we're going to be in paradise. Praise the name of Jesus. Can you say amen? Yes. yes. We, we love that particular scripture because, well, Eugene, that tells us an awful lot that, you know, there are people that, Say, well, you know, once you die, you're going to stay in the grave until whenever you do. No, that's not what Jesus said. What Jesus said is, when you die, you go to be with him. Bang, bang, right there, right there. It's all over. Now, I'm looking forward, Brother Jim, to paradise. Uh, a lot of people have asked, uh, Brother Mike, what is paradise? I said, well, I don't know a lot about it. I know this. It's in heaven. It's with Jesus. It's with those who were saved and have beaten me up. You know, they've gotten there first. And there is no night. I don't know a whole lot more about that, but that's enough for me. You know, I, I, I just get all kinds of happy and joyful over that. Uh, when we were in Vietnam, the, uh, the war belonged to the Americans during the day. The war belonged to the Vietnamese during the night. It was just as simple as that. I hated to see nightfall come, especially if I was on guard duty for a while, because I didn't know what was happening. And you can bet your last bottom dollar, I mean, I don't, don't gamble, but if you didn't gamble, this, this is the one you can bet on. You can bet your last bottom dollar when I was sitting in that guard jar behind that M60 machine gun. I kept looking down that river. There it is. That sun just beginning to break. It always broke just over the river, because the river was wide enough. Yes, sir, Brother Eugene, I love to see that sunshine come up. Because when that sunshine came up, I knew I was going to be all right. At least if I wasn't going to be all right, I was going to be able to see what was going on. But uh, that Easter Sunday morning, the sun came up. A few women went down to the uh, <coughs> tomb to find <laughs> Jesus. And that's basically where our story starts today. Um, Jesus was crucified wrapped up, uh, buried, and uh, put into a grave, put into a brand new tomb that no one had ever been in before, and a big, large rock was rolled over the front to seal him up. A cloth was wrapped around his face. I brought this just as an example. The example is what was called a tallet. A tallet was a cloth that for morning prayers the prayer warrior would cover his head. He would say his morning prayers, then he would slide his tallet back on his shoulders. For the most part, they would wear it like this. This is the garment, this is the napkin, this is the cloth that many people believe was wrapped around Jesus' head. We're going to get a little. We're going to get to that a little bit later. But uh, 
Jesus had promised his disciples that the grave could not hold him. And that's where we pick up this morning's service. He said, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you, Father, for all of your many blessings. Most importantly, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for what he means to us. Father God, we really thank you for Easter Sunday morning. Sometimes people say something that they believe is going to happen and it doesn't. They make prophecies that don't come to pass. Jesus Christ made an impossible prophecy when it comes to the minds of men. That prophecy was that he was going to be killed, he was going to die, he was going to be buried. And in three days, he would arise from the grave. To many, including some of his disciples, that was a thought that was an impossibility. But, <laughs> with the Son of God here, and Almighty God on the throne, there's nothing impossible. We thank you this morning that it did occur. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of knowing that it occurred. And we thank you, Father, since that it did occur, we can come to you in prayer, asking for pardon and remission of our sins. And we have done that this morning. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being able to thank you for it. Guide us and direct us the rest of this day, the rest of our lives. Take us home when this life is over. We'll give you the praise for it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. The uh, promise was that after three days, he would come out of the grave. And uh, this is pretty much how it happened right here. It's a lot of reading, but it's worthwhile to read it all. In Matthew 28, uh, verses 1 through 7, it says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door, and sat upon it. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Many things are in that scripture to see. First of all, it was the first day of the week. A lot of people here get confused. First day of the week, is it Sunday or is it Monday? Is it Monday or is it Sunday? Go look at the calendar. The calendar will tell you the first day of the week is Sunday. It always has been, always will be. That first day of the week, after Jesus Christ was crucified on Thursday, I know there's a lot of teaching around that says he was crucified on Friday. I can take you to God's word and prove to you it did not happen. He was crucified on Thursday. Crucified on Thursday to fulfill that other scripture we had up there, that three days and three nights he would be in the grave. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night he was in the grave. Uh, the three days, part of Thursday, part of Friday, part of Saturday, uh, he was there. Uh, rose on the first day of the week, so he fulfilled that scripture. Uh, it's unimportant to argue about which day it is, I was just pointing out the actual fulfillment of that scripture. But the first day of the week, Sunday, fulfilled the three days and three nights in the grave. The gravestone was rolled back, and the tomb was wide open as the women came down there. Uh, many of you have undoubtedly seen pictures of what is proposed to be the tomb of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's in a wide open plaza off to one side. As they came down into that plaza, they would have looked to see that stone, and, and they had the conversation in the scripture about how are we going to open that stone up. They needed to move that stone because what they were planning on doing was going in, getting the body of Jesus up to where they could work with it, and they were going to add spices to it. And of course, we, we asked, what in the world is the spices for? Well, if you've never been around a decomposing human body, uh, you have no concept of the idea. Uh, 
I've said it here in church before, I'll say it again. A, an old dead possum on the road or a squirrel or skunk or something like that, even a big dog, they have a bad odor as they're decomposing. I'm not sure why God did it. A human body, Sister Lee, is decomposing is the absolute worst smell you'll ever come across. They wanted to cover the smell of Jesus' body decomposing. That was what the whole thing was. Uh, they went there to, to do that. And uh, when you stop and think, uh, just like here, one of the most popular stones over there is limestone. The wheel or the stone that would have covered up the grave was probably limestone. Limestone weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot. Uh, if you take a five foot tall stone that's one foot deep, you figure out the circumference in the area and all that good sort of stuff, you've got a stone that weighs something in the neighborhood of 3,000 pounds. Uh, Linda, do you suppose you and Lori could move a 3,000 pound stone? Even if you got the two ladies behind you to help? No. That would, have, that would have been an impossibility. Plus the fact, the stone, what they did was they would have the stone on a level platform, but there where it goes over to lock in place, they would dig it out. So that when the stone rocked over there, it couldn't go farther, it couldn't go back. And it was a lot of work to move that thing. Well, it was a lot of work except for one small minor detail that's listed in there. The angel came. And I don't know how strong the angels are, but I do know in one place in the Bible it says that uh, the angel, archangel Michael withstood the entire army of Persia for 21 days. Now, I don't know how strong you got to be to do that, but I can tell you for a fact, I'm not going to argue with an angel. <laughs> that's, that's all there is to it. If he can move that stone by himself and he can withstand the army of Persia for 21 days, Brother Jim, I, I want to be on his side. But uh, they did. The, the, the limestone rock was moved back. The tomb itself is like a little tunnel. You can stand outside and see everything you need to see in there. Uh, the angels told the ladies, come see the place where the Lord lay. They could look inside and see he was gone. Now, some of the people who have interpreted what was said about Jesus Christ in there, everybody here knows what happens when a caterpillar makes a cocoon, and then the next, after winter, the butterfly comes out of the cocoon, and the cocoon just lays there or hangs there. Uh, some of those who have interpreted what was said about the resurrection have said that the grave clothes probably looked like that. Just like Jesus didn't slip out of them, he slipped up through them. And obviously, on Easter Sunday night, a little bit later than we're talking about today, with the doors closed, with the windows shuttered, with locks in place, the disciples were there discussing what had happened that day. Some had seen Jesus, some hadn't. Some didn't understand, some did. Uh, they were all in a turmoil, and all of a sudden, Jesus is standing in the middle of them saying, Peace be unto you. He came in without going through the door. Well, very, possible, very probably, he got out of the grave clothes in pretty much the same manner. But uh, they did not have to go in. All they had to do was stand there and look through the doorway. They could see everything they needed. Uh, again, Graves were traditionally sealed in those days. Large rocks were rolled in place to keep vandals and animals out. Uh, and it was also there to keep out what was called body snatchers. Now, in this particular grave, Jesus Christ being crucified, some of the people who opposed him went to uh, Pilate and said, hey, his disciples may come and steal his body in that. They could say then he's back to life. Uh, we need some help. We need a guard. So Pilate sent someone down there. We don't know for sure who it was. But the grave was sealed with a wax seal. There was a wax seal placed on there that if that stone was moved at all, that wax seal would be broken and someone would know. He was also given 16 soldiers to go down there and guard the place. 
It was their job to stay awake for the three days, make sure nobody came and stole the body. Now, I don't understand all of what I've read about body snatchers, but apparently at that same time in history, they would go to the tombs and literally steal the bodies. Well, the reason they stole the bodies was the linen garments. You and I don't think anything, you know, I paid, I don't know, 12, 13 dollars for this piece of cloth. Um, that's almost no real cost. Uh, Linda, would you take 13 dollars to go on a loom and make another piece of cloth like this for me? Would you do it, Brother Bob? Would you take the time to make this piece of cloth for me for $13? No. <laughs> we have me me mechanical means to do that. They did it. All of their cloth was hand woven. And to leave the body in there and allow it to go bad, to rot inside of that cloth, ruins that cloth. So literally, I know this sounds silly to us, but you have to look back at that particular point in time. They would steal the bodies out just to get the material that was wrapped around the body. It was a product that was expensive. Also, there were spices. Uh, we think of, I wouldn't want spices like that, but if the spices were taken off and put in a different container and you didn't know it, you'd buy the spices. And that's what they knew. They knew that they could get the spices they could put them in a different container. They could sell the spices. Uh, body snatching was a, a lucrative business. There was almost, there was no investment. They, they had no investment in getting this body other than the time to grab it, take it out, unwrap it, and non-godly um, people, the heathens. A lot of heathens would be buried with jewelry, with money. Uh, there were some religions in those days that they decided in order to get to their version of the promised land, they might have to pay. So when they buried the old boy, they buried him with money. Well, the great snatchers, yes, sir. Linda was buried and she, she believes in that big money you get to get into her heaven. We're going to snatch her body and get that money. And they did it. So the body snatchers had to be, it had to be protected from the body snatchers. It had to be protected from the Disciples, the uh, pilot had given them the guard. Again, 16 soldiers to watch over that, to make sure that nothing happened. Which brings us up to this point right here. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and were taking counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we, while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, he will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews even to today. Today's society, like the society in those days, uh, is very much opposed to the church, to Jesus Christ, to salvation, and to what's going on. You say, Brother White, this is a Christian, this is a Christian country. No, it's not. It was at one time. It has slowly but surely gotten away from being a Christian country. Jesus is not taught in schools today, but Mohammed and Islam are taught. Uh, they are taught to the point of, the, I've seen pictures where they have taken the students and taught them how to go down the proper way to Islam. Uh, actual students in government-sponsored grade schools and uh, junior high schools have taught down the prayers of Islam. And it's all being taught under the guise of, this is historical information the children need to know. The children do not need to know that Muhammad was a liar, was a thief, and he is dead. Well, I guess they should know that. But they don't need to have the understanding that he was the second Messiah after Jesus Christ, and that God preferred him before Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God. He was just simply a man who had a few prophecies 
and did, did a few minor miracles. That is the story that Islam teaches about Jesus Christ. And that's the good part. There's other parts they don't even teach Jesus Christ at all other than he was a man that had a following after him. That's all they teach. But it's taught under the guise of history, and many are working on the concept that Islam should be a one-world religion. <clears throat> the soldier's story is still being told today. The Bible says that, and it's historically correct. There are places where that soldier's story is still being told. Uh, it was not that he was not resurrected, that his disciples came and snatched him out. But there are some things that make that whole story uh, look bad, uh, be wrong, and it, uh, there are some things that, about that story that the ones who would teach that uh, kind of pull their hair out because they can't uh, get the things about it. Uh, for one thing, the linen wrappings, if the body snatchers had come, if the disciples had come and had stolen Jesus Christ, they would have taken the linen, the linen cloths that had wrapped his body. But when they came to the tomb, the linen cloths, so the single most important part of the reason a body snatcher would be there, the linen was still there. The only thing that was missing was the body, and that's the one thing that they had absolutely no value for. Now, if you get up into 1500, 1600, 1700, in Europe, body snatchers there snatched the bodies, but they took them, and they sold them to the universities, the universities cut them up to teach people how to become doctors and so forth. But that was 1500 years later. Back in Jesus Christ's day, they took the body off and if they did anything at all, they scratched out a, a hole in the sand, uh, buried the body in the sand, threw some rocks on so the dogs wouldn't dig it up, and left the way to sell, wash and sell the linen, get the spices out of it, get the money out of it, uh, do what they could to, I guess you could call it a job. I wouldn't call it a job. But the linen wrappings, the single most important prize of all, was gone. Or was still there. The only thing that was gone was the body itself. Uh, the other thing that we have to ask ourselves, how, how do you go into a grave? How do you first roll back a 3,000 pound stone in the middle of the night, not wake up the guards, not get the guards all, all busy? By the way, soldier, what happens when you go to sleep on, on, on guard duty? <laughs> Did you see that smile on his face back there? He knows what it's all about. In the days of the Navy that I was in, sleeping on guard duty would, would cost you a strike, at least. Sleeping on guard duty here would cost you your life if they were caught. When those guards took the money and promised to tell the story, they took their life in their own hands. But they, they also realized that when the angel came there, the scripture says that they appeared as dead men. The angel scared them so bad that they were passed out. I don't know. I cannot physically tell you what happened other than they were not awake. But if they were awake, and if this really was body snatchers, how did they get that stone moved? How did they slip in there? How did they unwrap Jesus' body? How did they get it out of there, and why did they leave the linen? Why did they leave the spices? Why? See, there's no answer. The other thing is this garment, the towel. The towel was a garment that every male Jew in Israel owned. If he was any kind of a religious individual at all, or wanted to appear to be a little bit religious. You've seen undoubtedly, uh, not pictures, but artist conceptions of Jesus walking, and you see this type of garment hanging over his shoulders. That was a typical way that it was worn. It would be worn today, up until maybe about four or five o'clock or 70 degrees out there, you don't need this. They actually had a little bag that they would fold this up, and it was a towel bag. That's you would think seeing Jews come walking along, yes, sir, that's a real nice purse you got there, bud. Well, it wasn't a purse. It was a towel bag. Now, they did keep a couple of other things in there. 
Uh, but the talent bag was for the talent. So that wherever they were, when it came time for morning prayer to get that dude out, you could not be caught doing morning prayers without your head covered. And I don't understand that. It was something that, it's not in the Bible, but it's something that the Jews decided to do, and uh, they did. But uh, when the other disciples came, and this is another part of the fun part that uh, nobody can explain. When the other disciples came, they found the towel or whatever cloth it was, and a lot of people believe that it was a towel. Jesus' towel, of course, being his part of his belongings, was gambled for by the soldiers at the foot of the cross. But Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus both, who were there to take the body and wrap it and put it in the grave, they would have both had their talents. This is not a worshipped religious cloth, don't get me wrong, in the, in the eyes of the Jews. But it was a special cloth because it was necessary for prayer. Um, you have things in your living room that are special to you, not necessarily to anybody else, but to you. Laying on a coffee table, on a shelf, uh, prominently displayed somewhere. The talent was sort of that way. It would have been something that would have been normal for Nicodemus to do, something for Joseph of Arimathea to do. When it came time to wrap Jesus' head and to wrap his face, let me use my talent. Let me donate to my Savior the greatest thing that I have right here. And that's what it would have been. Jesus recognized that sacrifice, if you will, on the part of Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. When he got up that morning, he folded the towel. He folded the napkin, is what's listed in the Bible. It's called a napkin. No one really knows why the folks who gave us the translation of the Bible, no one really knows why they use the word napkin. Very simply because in the days of Jesus, napkins were unknown. It, was, it had not been invented yet. Now, it is possible that the towel might have been used when you realize they didn't have tables like we did. They sat on the floor or leaned over on cushions and there was a small table about that tall and all the food on it. There were no forks and there were no spoons. So guess how you ate? Fingers. Whatever you ate, and, and I still haven't figured out how they would do biscuits and gravy, but whatever. I'm not sure they had biscuits and gravy in those days. <laughs> whatever they ate, they either had to lick their fingers clean or wipe them on something. Talent would have been an easy thing because they've got it on. You wipe the fingers on the talent. When you get done, you go wash the thing. It's a linen cloth. They were almost always linen. A few of them have used <clears throat> in the wintertime were wool, but for the most part they were linen. They, that could have been the reason that they called it a napkin. But to get farther along in, in the story, the wrapping, the folding of the cloth proved that Jesus Christ body was not stolen. If you were a body snatcher and you had moved the stone back, you had somehow gotten past the guards so that they didn't know that you were in there, you had in the middle of the middle of the night, pitch black dark, down in a grave site, you had unwrapped the body and everything. How do you fold that up so that it's prominently displayed? So that when the people came in the next day, they would see that. How do you do that? I'll tell you how you do it. You know, Jesus Christ did. That's how he's done it. And those are the things that the people who would continue with the story of the soldiers, well, you know, uh, we just kind of let them sleep. And, uh, well, they came and stole his body. Well, he was asleep. Yeah, uh huh. That story was a bad story from the start. 
this proves that that story was a bad story uh, when it started. But there's more that goes back uh, into the resurrection itself. Uh, and part of that is right here. The last scripture, or the next to the last scripture we're going to put up here. It says, Then comes Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre, and see if the linen clothes lie, and the napkin which was about his head, not lying in the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Uh, that's the King James Version. The uh, New Living Testament says, Then then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there where the cloth had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Uh, two different versions, uh, King James Version and New Living Testament version uh, tells about it. I don't usually like the New Living Bible, but uh, in this particular uh, version of what was going on, it tells us what happened uh, maybe a little bit better. Uh, again, the linen wrappings were still in the tomb, the most valuable prize of all. The body was gone, which had no value to the body snatchers. Uh, we talked about how do you wrap that body, uh, how do you take the time and effort to hold up uh, that prominently displayed uh, Talent covering his head. Uh, and the answer to these questions is actually found in one of the verses John gives us earlier in the book. And this particular uh, scripture here, he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. This is the scripture about loosing and letting go. Lazarus. Lazarus had died, had been in the grave four days. Jesus Christ came down and said, roll the stone away. And then he commanded Lazarus to come forth. When Jesus came out of the tomb, he came out without the grave clothes. And if you stop and think about a piece of linen approximately two feet wide and about 30 feet long being wrapped around your body to wrap your hands tight your feet and legs folded, and it wrapped around and round and round and round. And every time they went around, they dropped in some more spices and round and round and some more spices and round and round, and finally tucked in in the back. How do you get out of that? Tell me, how do you get out of that? Well, Lazarus didn't get out of that. Uh, a minister that uh, I have preached with in the, in the past, uh, Brother Paul. He was talking, in fact, his whole message one day was about Lazarus. And uh, he said, the only way that boy would have come out was like this. <laughs> Which is true. Jesus didn't come out that way. When Jesus came out, the grave clothes were left. That was folded up and laid there. Um, the proof that Jesus' body was not stolen Partially, it's right there with Lazarus. Lazarus was bound hand and foot, just like uh, Jesus was. Lazarus couldn't get out of that reminder that Jesus did. Uh, and again, the prayer shawl was not a perfect religious garment, but it was a slightly religious garment. It would have been something that either Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea would have been proud to have offered as the face covering of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would have been the perfect napkin. But we, we close today realizing that uh, Jesus Christ was crucified. Jesus Christ was wrapped up. Jesus Christ was buried. And then Jesus Christ arose from the grave on Easter Sunday morning. That's what makes Easter all about the land and not about the bunny. All about Jesus Christ's resurrection, and not about the chocolate Easter eggs. Uh, and we're thankful that that's, that, that is what it's all about. But he also left us a promise. Uh, he made the promise long before he went into the grave. And this promise is right here. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. But where I am, there you may be also. And we just close with this right here. Yes. The tomb is empty. Um, we normally have altar call at the end of every 
Secretary of Service. So, Sister Linda, if you'd like to come up. Uh, we, it will not be a long altar call. We realize that God has the ability to answer our prayers. Uh, we don't need to spend a long time asking for that answer. But as we stand this morning and Sister Linda sings that first verse of page 89. Is there one this morning that would say, Brother White, I need prayer? <clears throat> would you pray for me? Is there one this morning? Just come and take me by the hand. Is there one this morning?